Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Hope everyone is having a wonderful day so far. Welcome, everyone, to Red Planet Live. I am your host, Ashton Zeth. Okay. I'm elated to be hosting the Mars Society's podcast and leading the conversation about human exploration of the universe and the future settlement of Mars. As a longtime space enthusiast, I am passionate about STEM education and making humanity an interplanetary species. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today and supporting the Red Planet Live. Today's episode features a renowned planetary scientist and a former chief scientist of NASA with 42 years of experience known for his contributions in the study of planetary atmospheres and numerous missions under his leadership, including New Horizons uh, spacecraft flyby of Pluto, the Messenger spacecraft to Mercury, and overseeing the landing of Curiosity rover on Mars. He's a strong advocate for science education and public engagement, and his leadership has helped shape NASA's vision for future space exploration. Dr. James Green, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here today. Thanks so very much, Ashlyn. I'm excited to be chatting with you. I, I talked this up with, with all my friends and family and colleagues, and so I know we have a, a bunch of them listening, and like Good. I said, I'm really excited Good. to chat with you today. That's great. Well, before we kick off the conversation uh, with James, I have two special Mars Society announcements to share. The first is uh, that the Mars Society recently announced the first cadre of 35 Mars Society ambassadors who have been formally accepted into the program. These ambassadors are a group of professionals and advocates who are committed to raising public awareness about the importance of exploring and ultimately settling Mars. The program is led by James Melton, a former journalist, college instructor, and professional pilot who now delivers keynote speeches and lectures worldwide on leadership, relationships, and the future. This group of 35 ambassadors consists of individuals from a wide range of backgrounds, including education, science, nonprofit work, and business, and are all from a variety of countries and cultures. In addition, the group includes many people uh, of different age groups, from students who are currently enrolled in higher education programs, uh, up to individuals who are active and hopefully uh, enjoying retirement. The diversity of these ambassadors ensures that they bring an array of perspectives and exper expertise to their advocacy work. Over the tenure, uh, over the course of their tenure as Mars Society ambassadors, the group will work together to promote the importance of human exploration and settlement of Mars. They will share their knowledge and insights through a variety of channels, including public speaking engagements, social media, and other forms of outreach. The program is expected to expand in the coming year with additional ambassadors being added to the group. For more information and to apply, visit marssociety.org. Congratulations to the new Mars Society ambassadors. Don't forget to, uh, to wear your patch. And the second uh, announcement that I have for Mars Society is that the Mars Society is thrilled to announce that their 26th annual International Mars Society Convention will take place this year from October 5th to 8th at Arizona State University in Tempe. This four-day event will bring together leading scientists, policymakers, commercial space executives, government representatives, media, and space enthusiasts to discuss pressing topics related to space exploration, technology advances, and planning for human exploration and settlement of Mars. Now to uh, ensure maximum participation, the Mars Society will employ innovative technology platforms for in-person and virtual presentations, panel discussions, and debates. Attendees from around the world can join the conference, post questions, and interact with each other. Further details about the event, such as registration, uh, information, a list of confirmed speakers, suggested hotel accommodations, and requirements for the poster contest will be released soon. Get ready to explore Mars with the Mars Society and stay tuned for more updates. All right, James, are we ready? Yes, but you have to call me Jim. Jim, okay. <laughs> well, we'll keep it casual, Jim, as you requested. Uh, that, yeah, that's what I refer to. Um, so on the Red Planet Live, uh, I do a segment called Question of the Day. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this particular question uh, is going to be a heated debate, and I, I'm curious to see what everybody votes online. So uh, make sure to put your answer in the chat, uh, which should be on, on one of your sides here. So today's question of the day is, are you more of a Star Wars or a Star Trek fan? 
what do we think here? I know it's a it's a heated debate every time it comes up. What do you think? Oh, should I answer it? Or are you, what is your, your preference? Are you more a Star Wars or Star Trek person? All right. Well, uh, I saw the original Star Trek um, from the first episode. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was really a change uh, in a major way. Uh, the, in, the, in the 60s, it was, uh, you know, cowboy shows, uh, half gun will travel, riflemen, all the, you know, everything you can imagine. And then all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're taken into space. You, you visit planets. You know, you, you look for M-class planets so you can breathe on the surface. And you know, so it was, uh, it was really, uh, to me, uh, the, the seminal change in, uh, in, in the, the normal culture going on. And so I think uh, that, that's what I would say would be my favorite because of that. It's also a time when, you know, we were moving towards, that, that went on from 66 to 69. It was mm -hmm. also a time when we were moving towards um, uh, putting humans on the moon. So uh, uh, it really, uh, it really, I think, uh, sparked a lot of what's going on. Now, not taking much away from Star Wars, it, that, that, that just kept the momentum going, but for a different, different group, a different age group. Yeah. For, for sure. I, I agree with you. You completely, um, you know, I, I do recognize that the significant impact that Star Wars made on, on film and pop culture and, yep. and sci-fi. Uh, yep. But personally, I do prefer Star Trek, uh, specifically Next Generation. Um, if you haven't had a chance to watch it, um, the oh, new yeah. Picard yeah. series on Paramount is really good. Okay. Uh, yeah. So subtle, subtle plug there for, for the new series. Um, I would also say Star Trek over Star Wars. Well, you know, Janeway was pretty neat too. And, and Seven of Nine, I mean, I had an opportunity to meet Seven of Nine. Mm -hmm. Jerry Ryan came to Goddard Space Flight Center uh, oh, wow. during an outreach activity in the, um, in the 90s. And uh, I was uh, uh, head of the National Space Science Data Center and uh, she was taking a variety of tours and I was on the tour. <laughs> so yeah. She came over to the organization. We had an opportunity to talk about some of the satellites that we're doing. Um, and uh, that, that was really delightful. She was really uh, into, and I'm sure she still is, uh, outreach, uh, particularly for um, uh, young women and girls. They're you know, just, just a wonderful role model uh, of getting involved uh, that I had an opportunity to, to meet her, but I also met Uhura. Uh, oh, yeah. She, yeah, yeah. She, uh, she uh, had an opportunity to come to the Grail launch. Now, Grail is a lunar mission. It's two spacecraft that, that uh, actually monitor the distance between the two of them that orbited the moon. And, and they were, they would move between the two attracted by gravity underneath them. And after uh, 90 days, you get a complete uh, view of what's inside the moon based on gravitational interactions of these two spacecraft. And uh, she went to that. She gave five interviews. She was absolutely fantastic. She signed pictures for free. You know, if you go to a Star Trek convention, right. you probably pay 20 bucks per picture to get her to mm -hmm. sign something. But here she, she did it for free. And the line went out the building and around. I mean, and she was there for two hours signing pictures. I mean, just just wonderful people like that. Another enormously important role model. I mean, yeah. really important. She was quite seminal, as you probably know, um, uh, for not only representing women, of course, but but black young women involved in top shows uh, in that time period was a rarity. So, um, and she was just delightful, just, just really wonderful, wonderful person to interact with. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many stories about, um, you know, her cultural impact and, and how she influenced uh, film and, you know, TV being, being a woman, um, like you said, you know, African-American woman on, on yes. TV and the impact that had. So yeah, I, I would agree for sure. Uh, I think that the chat is overwhelmingly Star Trek. So I, I'm glad to know that we have other, uh, other Trekkies among us. Well, they're, they, you know, uh, it's, it, 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 they're both wonderful. Uh, I enjoy science fiction. 
uh, you have to be able to dream and think about the future uh, if you're ever going to have a future. Uh, this is, um, you know, like uh, like seminal seminal things that along the way ha that have happened, like uh, the Andy Weir's books on uh, not only um, uh, not only uh, uh, the Martian, but Artemis, and now and now Hail Mary. I'm and, reading uh, that right now. Yeah. Well. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. It's, it's, Mary. Okay. Yeah, I, I, admittedly, no spoilers. I'm not no spoilers. Yet. <laughs> Just started. Uh, I, you know, bought it for my my flight uh, to to Florida to go to Kennedy Space Center last ah, week. So, uh -huh. Um, I'm not too far in it yet. So yeah, don't okay. don't spoil anything for me. But no uh, I'm excited about it. And that's pretty cool. I mean, you have a special connection there. Uh, I do. Contributed a little bit to what level? You I can did. tell us um, to the Martian. It, it, I will. Uh, what happened one day is uh, uh, Ridley Scott decided he needed an expert on Mars since he now was going to produce the movie. The script was already written by Drew Goddard. Uh, it was a, you know, Ridley really loved it. And he called up NASA headquarters and he said, I want to talk to somebody that knows something about Mars. OK, now, as head of planetary, uh, I had three branches in my organization. Uh, one was a research and analysis group. Another one was solar system missions uh, uh, that were discovery and new frontiers. But then I had a Mars branch. And uh, the head of the Mars branch, we commonly referred to as the Mars czar. And, uh, and Chuyatel Ejiofor uh, really plays that person in the movie. Mm -hmm. And that's the person that looks at all the robotic missions, uh, interacts with... Um, uh, JPL in terms of their management, uh, how they're tasked, how they coordinate communication off the surface, all the stuff you basically see in the movie. That's you know that's a run out of the Mars program. Well, Doug McQuiston was that person. He retired after the successful landing of Curiosity, and so I was acting in that role. So then that interaction with Ridley Scott fell to me. <laughs> okay. Kind of landed in your lap. Just landed in my lap. So I had a chance to, to talk to Ridley and his team for um, uh, almost an hour. And uh, they wanted to talk about a whole variety of issues from, from you know, what is Mars really like? Uh, you know, what is um, uh, uh, ion engines, space suits, all kinds of stuff. And um, uh, I, I had a blast talking to him, but I said, okay, um, what we need to do is we need to get you to these places. We need to organize a trip to, um, to Johnson Space Center so you can see what, what um, Mars habitats we're thinking about, Mars vehicles we're thinking about. You need to get to JPL so you can see how we manage the robotic spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, and so let me organize that and uh, get back to you. So that was the end of the conversation. But before it was over, they'd already sent me the script. <laughs> so this was like on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hadn't read the book. They asked me if I'd read the book and I hadn't read the book at the time. So I got an ebook, read that and the script. And then on Monday, we had a major meeting in um, the Office of Communication at NASA headquarters. And they turned to me and said, uh, well, what do you think? Should we should we support, uh, you know, uh, uh, this movie? Uh, should NASA provide some sort of uh, uh, capabilities and consulting uh, with Ridley? And, and, and I said, um, absolutely. We need to do whatever Ridley wants because he wants to make it as realistic as possible. The look, the feel, uh, you know, what's, what is really going to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, hold the attention of the audience uh, yeah. that, that uh, in addition to the script and the book. So uh, they said, go for it. You're going to lead it <laughs> and as if I didn't have enough to do. So uh, I also uh, led, um, led that and how, how we did it was I gave them the tours and that was great. Then we had questions that were coming in every week. And so I'd go through the questions and there'd be some I'd answer and then some I'd farm out to other people to answer and then we just kept doing that for several months. And then all of a sudden, silence. <laughs> now they're really going out and doing yeah. it. And then I had an opportunity to go to the premiere, which was at the Toronto Film Festival. So uh, it was, it was uh, great fun. And, um, and I think Ridley did a fabulous job. 
making it as realistic as possible uh, with our help. Yeah. Jim, I have to admit, uh, you know, this is kind of a full circle moment for myself. Uh, often when I watch space movies, um, you know, not that I'm an expert, but I'm always picking apart like, oh, that's not real. That wouldn't actually happen. So I appreciate that, you know, they connected with you and you provided the insights to, you know, keep the, the scientific integrity of the movie. To, people want to believe that this is real. Sure. Um, sure. And if, you know, they can immediately identify some, some you know, holes in that plot and sure. this is not realistic. Uh, you, you might lose some of those believers, but if they feel inspired, hey, this could actually happen. Uh, you, you've got fans for life. So I, I appreciate uh, that, that you wanted to keep it as, as real as possible by providing those insights. Well, I, actually, I'm a little different, uh, although I really wanted this movie to, to be what Ridley wanted, which was realistic. Right. Uh, and, and I think we did a fabulous job of that. He, he really led that and we, we supported him. But, um, uh, you know, when I go to any science fiction movie, I'd leave the, you know, my science at the door, grab some popcorn and go in and just let, you know, just enjoy it mm -hmm. uh, and let it be what it is. And uh, I, I'm really not too critical about uh, about about science fiction movies as they come up. All but right. The Martian was is certainly one of my favorites. Uh, that has to that has to be right up there. Yeah, I know. I would agree with you there. Are there other space movies? I mean, you said Martian oh, is right up there. What are 2000, some of your 2001. I mean, you know, yes. in 68, yeah. here's Star Trek. We were just talking about that. And now we're going to the moon, you know, and, and now 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 2001 hits the screen, you know, and, and even though the you know, as I walked out of the movie, I thought, what what the heck did I just see? You know, what did it all mean? And, you know, and, and I had to figure it out for myself, uh, you know, as uh, as Arthur C. Clarke wanted mm -hmm. us to. But um, uh, the bottom line is that was a fabulous era. You know, just that just that decade, the latter part of the 60s into the 70s uh, was fantastic. I was in high school, I graduated in 69 and then went to the University of Iowa. And, and I ended up working in an observatory. I had a 12 inch Alvin Clark refractor at my beck and call. This was the year uh, uh, that Mars had a close approach to the earth. You know, Mars's orbit is elliptical. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we, we side up to the, the, the area sometimes when our, we're real close to it, like 32 million miles away. And so okay. I took a whole series of of images, I, I built a built a, a an instrument that had a, a camera body connected to the telescope. Did all sorts of astrophotography. The book developed it myself, submitted it, got some things in Sky and Telescope. You know, even published in Sky and Telescope. So I, you know, when I went to the University of Iowa, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and that is get involved in space. Uh, and uh, that was just the perfect place. Van Allen was there. Uh, you know, James Van Allen, our, our first, uh, you know, truly, truly creative and, uh, and wonderful uh, space scientist that, that discovered the Van Allen radiation belt. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I stayed there, got my undergraduate master's and Ph.D. there. It was fantastic. So after after that, you know, walk us through what you did after that. You, you got your Ph.D. Yeah. How did you end up at NASA? Well, uh, my Ph.D., uh, my master's and PhD thesis advisor, Don Gurnett, which was one of Van Allen's early students, uh, his philosophy was I could, I could go anywhere I wanted to and give a talk uh, about the research I was doing. And so I was giving like three talks a year at AGU and at special conferences. And I did that in my master's and my PhD so that was uh, six years, three years master's, three years PhD. So when I got my degree, I actually was pretty well known. I, I had already published several papers. One of one of which, uh, one of the first ones I did was um, uh, is highly cited because it's an early set of observations on a very important phenomena about the Earth. It's called auroral kilometric radiation. It's the it's the radio waves that that are generated just above aurora. Mm -hmm. And from Jupiter, they're called the decametric emissions. But here at Earth, they're kilometric emissions. And so we observed that from space, can't see it from the ground. And, uh, and so uh, I had five job offers. And uh, I picked uh, becoming a civil servant at Marshall Space Flight Center. 
And uh, so in 1980, I showed up and, and uh, got busy analyzing data from Dynamics Explorer in addition to the Voyagers. Uh, I was still working with Don Grenett on, on, um, and several others, Doug Manetti and, and others uh, on, uh, on analyzing Voyager data, Voyager 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, 42 years with NASA and, you know, like I said, oversaw uh, quite a few missions. Um, I have a, a ton of questions about, you know, the, the various projects and missions that you helped with at, at yeah. NASA. But I want to make sure that I, I call this out as well. Uh, for those that are tuning in and listening, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I will be sure to uh, sprinkle those through uh, the questions that I have prepared for, for Jim. Uh, but I want to be able to ask your questions as well. So thinking of... NASA and its missions. Um, you know, I was really curious uh, to hear your perspective um, on, on Artemis. Obviously, yeah. NASA, uh, Artemis, Artemis recently had its successful launch, yep. sent its rocket to moon and, and returning. Yep. And NASA just announced that the next four astronauts that will be returning yep. to the moon, including first woman and person yep. of color. Um, so for those that are listening, you know, tell us why it's important to return to the moon. What are the scientific benefits? What will astronauts do when they get there? This is um, really an exciting era, uh, it, it, you know, because in the last 10 years, we've really uh, discovered things about the moon that we didn't realize for decades. You know, uh, the Apollo missions brought back some spectacular set of samples, but those are largely in mid latitudes to low latitudes and nothing from the poles. What we're finding now is that what's in the poles, particularly in these permanently shadowed areas where the sun doesn't shine, is some really spectacular volatiles. Now, to understand that, you have to recognize the origin of the moon and the Earth uh, comes from um, uh, a theory that now uh, looks like it's pretty solid. It's called the giant impact hypothesis, whereas the Earth was being formed, the proto-Earth, and and other objects in the solar system. Another object called Thea, the uh, size of, um, uh, of uh, Mars, was also in, in and around our orbit, hit the Earth. And so when the two of them settled down after this massive collision, you end up with the Earth and the Moon. And the Moon is about four Earth radii away. It's just outside the Roche limit. It's, and so inside the Roche limit, where there's still debris, all that falls on the planet, just like the rings of Saturn are falling on the Saturn uh, uh, planet. Uh, and so now the moon over time is going to gradually move away from the Earth. We also found out that the moon during this time period uh, generated its own magnetic field. So the magnetic field of the Earth and the moon began to interconnect. And this provides early Earth atmosphere to the poles of the moon. We also find out that during the time period called the late heavy bombardment, where we think that uh, the Jupiter and Uranus and, and Neptune and Saturn rearranged themselves a little bit. Perhaps there was another planet uh, in, in the way there too. We don't know. Uh, that caused a, a major influx of, of asteroids and perhaps uh, other objects, perhaps uh, comets and things, uh, maybe even Kuiper Belt objects. Certainly Kuiper Belt objects moved into the asteroid belt. We think Ceres is a Kuiper Belt object, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th those volatiles hammered the moon, blowing away huge pieces of the crust, allowing the lower crust upper mantle material to flow in and create the dark areas that we call mare, but it also uh, creates the outgassing that comes with volcanoes. And that means Mars, or sorry, the moon had an atmosphere. Yeah. So this atmosphere comes when the moon had a magnetosphere. And, and indeed what happens during this time period is the magnetosphere protects that atmosphere a little bit, allows it to live a little longer. The current estimates are that the, magneto the magnetosphere protected the lunar atmosphere for at least a couple hundred million years. And, and what happens during this time period is that those volatiles then would migrate to the poles. The atmospheric pressure is twice that of Mars today, about 12 millibar, 10 to 12 millibar. And so you can imagine that the, the snowing out of these volatiles on the polar polar regions of the uh, of the moon 
are also laying in these permanently shadowed regions. So the bottom line is when we go in there to get access to, to water, we know there's water in there, that has come from comets, it has come from the earth, it has come from meteorites, it has come from the moon itself over the, the several billion year history of these deposits flowing into the polar region. So the history of, of those interactions is laying in these permanently shadowed regions. So we want to core those. Now, they may be mixed up due to, due to micrometeors hitting the environment, but mm -hmm. we should get a general sense of, of what was going on over, over the history of the Earth and Moon. So this is, just opens up a huge area for us to be able to study by going in there and getting the samples, let alone using those, uh, using the water that comes from that and other volatiles, you know, CO, CO2 is probably in there too, and, and perhaps in abundance, and, and extracting the oxygen and, and being able to use that. Of course, for the water, we want to drink it. H2O is H2O, whether it's here on Earth or it's on the moon or on Mars, is water. And, and, and of course, you can tease it apart, and create rocket fuel, or you can you know, breathe the O2. So the water it provides just a tremendous resource. All that was completely unknown in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, you know, and, and part of the part of uh, the early 2000s. And it wasn't it wasn't until this last 10 to 15 years that we really started piecing together a new story about what really is happening uh, uh, in the polar areas of the moon, and that's where we're going to go visit. That's what makes Artemis, to me, a tremendously important uh, uh, set of uh, missions and goals. Uh, scientifically, it'll be spectacular. It will be a boon to our understanding of what's going on, in addition to being able to learn to live and work on a planetary surface, which we want to do before we go to Mars. Yeah. That, that was going to be my next question is how is the Artemis missions and going back to the moon is going to prepare us for the future, uh, sending humans to Mars and the eventual settlement? Sure, of Mars? sure. Well, being able to live off the land, ISRU, is, is really uh, what we want to do in situ resource utilization, ISRU. Uh, and, and that means if there's resources there, we want to use them. Okay, mm -hmm. so if there's water in the permanently trapped... Uh, or shadowed regions uh, uh, trapped in these craters and we get access to it, we're going to drink it. We're going to use it. it. Those processes of how to be able to tease that stuff out, how to melt it, how to utilize it in, in the ways I had just mentioned, the drinking, breathing, and, and, and rocket fuel are, are processes we want to we wanna be able to test and use and then do that indeed on, um, on Mars itself. Now, of course, we've started that process a little bit with Percy. Perseverance mm -hmm. has a, a really nice experiment, MOXIE, which is designed to bring in the Mars atmosphere, zap that CO2, popping off an oxygen. And then, of course, uh, free oxygen loves to connect and create O2, which then is breathable. And then you have a CO, you end up with a carbon monoxide and oxygen in, in the experiment. You vent the, uh, the carbon monoxide, and now you, now you got a, a ready source of oxygen to breathe. That's the oxygenator from the Martian, okay, <laughs> if you will. And, and it's a great little unit, and it's working perfectly. It's, it's, it's doing astounding things. And in fact, we get, that can be scaled. And uh, if it's scaled, then uh, you could set it down on the surface and it can make, uh, you know, a rocket fuel before you even show up, as an example. But uh, Mars, has, Mars has also some spectacular resources. Uh, what many may not realize is um, uh, with our radars on Mars Express and Shroud on, uh, on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that mm -hmm. we have teased out a particular area on Mars, which is the old North Pole. Now, you know, the Mars tilt, uh, its axis of tilt is 23 degrees at the moment, but it can be as low as 15, but as high 
is more than 45 degrees. And so it just flips all over the place. Mm -hmm. And that means then the polar cap uh, migrates. Uh, and indeed, uh, we, we believe we have found the location of one of the old North Poles, and it has a considerable amount of water, ice. I mean, it, we believe it's about the size of the state of Arizona. Uh, it, it can be 750 meters deep in some places. And so I, th I, 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 I think the best places to be able to land and live on Mars will be in one of these areas that connects into this ancient uh, North Pole, this glacier, this buried glacier. Now, in some places, it's not very buried very deep, maybe mm -hmm. under a handful of meters of, 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 um, uh, of soils and regolith um, uh, and dust that you then can go in and bring in the, bring in the ice. And that, that's far better than trying to extract it, I think, out of, um, uh, out of some of the other sources, uh, the minerals and the and, and, and other sources, uh, if, the, if it's readily available, let's just go, let's just go do it. Mars has an enormous amount of water. It's just primarily in ice form. Yeah, I'm trying to extract it. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I, I heard you say before was um, disruptive technologies. Yes. Um, so I, I'm curious, you know, what, in your experience, what are some of those di disruptive technologies and what disruptive technologies do we need to get us to Mars? Okay. Uh, in my career, there's been a bunch of them. You know, uh, in 1980, I had an opportunity to, to start NASA's first internet. Now, we take internet for granted, but I got news for you. Uh, prior to that, you know, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you picked up a phone, which was connected to the wall by a cord, by the way, and, uh, uh, or you sent them a fax or a telex. You know, it's uh, it's it's not like it is today, where it's where it's email and it's all kinds of applications, remote log on, running supercomputers. That was a tremendously disruptive technology, and then of course in the in the 1990s, uh, the World Wide Web came along, providing access to data, and and now we're motivated because we have tools uh, to be able to provide data to users in real time. As as I mentioned, I was head of the National Space Science Data Center. And one of the reasons why I got the job is I, I had already supported and built a good chunk of NASA's first internet. And, that, and now I had the opportunity to put uh, the National Space Science Data Center online. And so we brought up, we brought a, a, a big terabyte worth of data, <laughs> which was huge at the time, right. online. I mean, I got four terabytes in my Mac sitting in front of me, you know. Uh, and, and that had all the IUE data, International Ultraviolet Explorer. We had also IRAS data, and we had uh, all kinds of heliophysics missions and all, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, and that data, you, you just log on and go get it. And, and that was tremendously important because the World Wide Web provided that interface that allowed you to get access to the data that you're putting online. Mm -hmm. Well, currently... You know, and a couple beautiful disruptive technologies are right staring us right in the face, and we're using them like crazy. And we're going to do more of it. And that is, of course, the metaverse and AI, you know, artificial intelligence. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in my opinion, is something that we need to embrace, we need to use it. Uh, we need to understand where it's good and where it isn't good in terms of, uh, of relying on the information we receive. You know, um, uh, information literacy is so important. Yeah. We have to teach that. We have to teach analytical thinking more. Uh, and, and these kind of technologies are really critical for us to be able to, I think, bring in and use. So I, I think we'll see uh, many more applications for the, those two in particular over the next couple of years. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I agree with you there. And I was I was just watching um, an interview with with Elon Musk talking about uh, AI and, and the potential of it, but also uh, some potential necessary regulations. So sure. that's, that's an interesting sure. topic as well. But well, I want to make sure. Oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say NASA, NASA has a working group and this working group's been going, oh, at least a year now on the ethical uses of AI. OK, 
Okay. So th they're, they're working really hard to discuss uh, how AI is going to be uh, used in the, in, in the agency, perhaps some of the ground rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, chat GPT, you know, as an example of, uh, yeah. Here, here's a model on how uh, information is brought in, analyzed, and then spit back out. Uh, uh, publishing what that model is, getting mm -hmm. people to comment on it. Uh, you know, understanding the results that you get out. You know, I, 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 I've used ChatGPT a bunch in a variety of ways. For instance, some, uh, some uh, there's been a number of really important papers that have come out by Chinese scientists in in Chinese journals. Well, I'm not good in Chinese, you know. My languages are Fortran and C++, you know, and if it's anything other than that, it's not going to happen, okay? And so um, uh, I just take the paper, you know, which you can, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's free, you uh, PDF it, and, and, then, and then you feed it in chat GPT, and it translates it for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is fantastic in the sense that you... Get a sense for what these what what the uh, what the scientists are saying, and some of the translation might be off, but you really get a good idea what's happening. And, and that's just one of a gazillion ideas that people are coming up with uh, fa really fabulous uses of AI. But I can also uh, ask it uh, a variety of questions, for which uh, there's uh, quite a bit of scientific literature that have been accomplished, and it, it will come back with the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. And then when you ask it, well, what references did you use to create that answer? Okay. Uh, it will come back and make up your references. I mean, it gives you DOIs that don't even exist. So you really, you know, you really have to know where, what, what, what's happening in the state of the art right now to be able to use this kind of technology, but it's going to yeah. be really important. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree with you there. Um, speaking of, the, the Chinese papers and, and the publications around their science, I did have a question uh, specifically about China, uh, uh -huh. who has clearly become a major uh, spacefaring nation, mm -hmm. having sent rovers to the moon and Mars and um, is looking to send, you know, future uh, satellites and rovers. A lot of people feel that there is a new space race now. What are your thoughts on that? And do you feel like the U S and China could eventually cooperate on exploring space? Well, you know, the U S and Russia, Okay, it was yes. the Soviet Union mm -hmm. uh, cooperated even in the '70s? Uh, uh, you know where the Soyuz and Apollo connected, and you know there, uh, space has been viewed, uh, uh, certainly uh, laying out, being laid out in the Outer Space Treaty, with the foundation of space not being uh, a hostile place, but being a place of cooperation uh, internationally. And uh, space station is a fabulous example of that. Uh, you know, we 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 want to embrace that. Now, um, uh, China uh, and and Russia have the opportunity to get involved with some of the NASA activity through mm -hmm. the Artemis Accords. Yeah, they, they they indeed could 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 connect to NASA and say we'd like to sign the Artemis Accords, and NASA would be delighted to to let that happen. And uh, right now, there's uh, on the order of at least 25 countries that have signed the Artemis Accords. And we were just talking about going to the moon. Mm -hmm. The differences, of course, are many. Uh, ISRU is one that we talked about. But how we're going back to the moon is the other. With the Apollo, it was a, it was a U.S. only activity. Right. And now when we go back, we really want to go back in an international way where we have uh, uh, you know, at, we have a Canadian astronaut in, in yeah. the upcoming mission, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so the Artemis three is uh, more than likely going to have uh, also uh, international international astronauts involved in that, too. But we 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 want to work together in a coordinated way. And, and I think the Artemis Accords lay out a really good opportunity for nations to participate in. And, and be part of, I think, one of the one of this generation's greatest achievements and going back to the moon uh, and, and really teasing out what's happening, living and working on a planetary surface. Not a little sorte like the Apollos where you're there for a day or two in your home. Right. But stay there weeks, months, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and really, really use the environment um, 
uh, as it's meant to, from our perspective, is a platform for observation. We can study the cosmos there. We can study the, the history of the solar wind is laying in the regulate that you're walking on. Okay, how can we tease it out? You know, what's, what's the history of our sun been like? You know, that has allowed life to flourish on this planet, but not on Venus or, you know, and, and so some of, these, some of these really important questions could be, could be answered by, by, uh, by that vantage point of going to the moon and really staying there for long periods of time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think right now is a, a piv pivotal, uh, an incredible time for uh, the next generation, uh, inspiring, obviously, you know, young people to be involved in STEM, have future careers in, in science and in engineering and technology, mathematics, obviously. Uh, but it will be interesting to see, yeah, the next, like you said, Artemis three, which members of perhaps yeah. uh, the European Space Agency uh, may be included on, on that crew. Um, and yeah, to have long duration stays on the moon, uh, similar to, you know, astronaut Scott Kelly, when he spent a year on the space station, yeah. I would see something like that on, on the surface of the moon as well. That, that'd be great. Let's do that. Yeah. All right. We're in. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's uh, hold up. I want to take some, uh, some questions from the sure. audience. We have some great questions. Uh, let's see. The first one that I'm going to read here is. Uh, when do you estimate that nuclear thermal propulsion technology could be used for future NASA crewed missions to Mars? And that's from uh, Thomas Cleveland. It's going to be a while, uh, but there could be some major breakthroughs that happen. It starts, of course, with NASA working with the Department of Energy. Now, uh, we do work with Department of Energy a lot. You know, when I was head of planetary, uh, Department of Energy managed a small amount of plutonium that came from uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Cold War era of making nuclear material for bombs. And it was a product of that. It, it's, not, uh, it's not bomb grade anything, but plutonium-238 is just the right isotope. And we had a small amount and, and, and that meant, you know, well, what about missions like uh, uh, Percy? Where are, we, where are we gonna get the material to, to have other robots uh, on, uh, on Mars, or even going out to Uranus and Neptune, you know, where the sun is very dim and, and, uh, and solar, solar panels are not, not, uh, not going to cut it. So I worked with the administration at the time to restart plutonium production, and we came up with a way to do it. So I know we're working with Department of Energy is really critical, and, and they have, they're so talented in many ways uh, that uh, they created a process completely separate from, from what was done in the past to create plutonium-238, and now they're doing it on a regular basis. And that means the planetary missions of the future will survive in, in, in going to the places where the sun doesn't shine very much. I mean, even if you wanted a sample from Mercury, you'd get it on the night side. You'd probably use radioisotope power to power your systems, go down and get your sample and then come off. You wouldn't get it on the day side. It's too darn hot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and the infrastructure to do that is too hard. So all that kind of stuff, you know, and that includes, you know, uh, uh, power even uh, on the moon is, uh, is a new relationship with the Department of Energy that NASA has. And that research is going on. Uh, I don't, I'm not up on where they are right now in terms of um, uh, what their plans are to be able to uh, uh, be able to get uh, uh, these systems up and running. Mm -hmm. uh, but my bet is it's going to take a while. Um, uh, so I, I, I think our first set of missions to Mars will probably be pretty traditional. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I hear you. Well, speaking of you know missions to Mars and energy uh, and systems, we have a question from David Rodriguez, which is, how will Earth moving equipment such as bulldozers, excavators, dump trucks be delivered to Mars? They need big rockets. <laughs> like yeah. Starship coming up? Is, is uh, that well, kind of uh, uh, rocket? Yeah, you know, we know we know of a big rocket right now that's working, and, and, and that's the SLS. Mm -hmm. And that can carry an enormous amount of material. Uh, uh, so uh, we, we got to have them. We got to have a set from, from the small to the large. 
And it's great that we now have choices coming up. If Starship pans out and it has the opportunity to, to fill a niche, then that's what we want. Uh, but right now, the SLS is working. I mean, they're mm -hmm. literally building the, the second Artemis SLS right now. Artemis II yes. SLS is under construction right now. So um, uh, we're lucky that we have such a powerful capability. And it's more powerful than, than the Saturn V. And it fits in a new class. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the Starship is welcome. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll each have jobs that they'll be able to do and do well. Yeah. Are you, uh, are you excited about, are you going to be tuning in for the, the Starship uh, launch scheduled originally for yesterday, but being pushed yeah. to Thursday? You're going to be tuning uh, in? Well, I, 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 if the t time ends up being convenient, yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if not, you know, uh, it, it will, it will happen and I'll read about it, but um uh, it doesn't mean I'm not excited about it. Indeed, I am. I'm, I'm wishing that'll be successful and that we now have a, a new tool uh, in our arsenal. Yeah, you know, I, I was curious about, uh, you know, your, your thoughts on the partnership between uh, NASA and SpaceX specifically. Um, I, I think I mentioned this earlier that I was just at Kennedy Space Center and I, I saw the uh, big Blue Origin building okay. while I was down there. So, so not just SpaceX, sure, sure. but Blue Origin as well. Sure. Uh, but what are your thoughts on that partnership? Um, you know, how critical is it to have oh, those, it's very uh, critical. those relationships? Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 I was at NASA headquarters when the plans were emerging that we really needed to, to, uh, to spark a lot more of the commercial activity. We were getting into the era where we were learning a lot about how to work in low Earth orbit. We wanted to go to the moon and then on to Mars. Uh, NASA needs to turn over that area into more commercial activities. And, and, it, and it can't just happen overnight. You got to make investments. So NASA indeed was, was uh, putting money into these, uh, you know, like crazy. Uh, and indeed, they're, they're, they're just tremendously successful. And that's, uh, that's really great news uh, because we, we, we do like competition. I see one of the comments about the SLS being expensive. Uh, yeah, it's expensive. Uh, does that mean everyone will be expensive? Well, it depends on how often it's used. If you have an infrastructure and you, you, you then have several groups working, then that lowers the price. Is the SLS unique? Yes, it is the only one right now working that can really put out uh, heavy lift vehicles uh, uh, you know, and, and go places. Uh, do we want where, what, are, what are some of the places we want to go? Well, the heliophysicists want to go to the nearest star. Okay, So does the astrophysicists. How are we going to do that? Well, you need something that's really huge to kick it off with a gravity assist at the sun and end up going, you know, 50, 60 kilometers per second, you know, uh, you know, at enormous speeds. And that's the only way you're going to be able to make it far. So all that, you, you, you just have to, uh, you know, figure out, is it worth it? Do we really want to do it? And, 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 and gee, that sounds so expensive. For crying out loud, we just did a James Webb T Space Telescope at $10 billion. And look at the fantastic things it's doing. And, you know, I want astrophysics to have even better tools. Well, how are we going to do that? We need bigger rockets, you know. And so I think, I think both Starship and the SLS have futures. And let's, let's embrace them and, and, uh, and give them the things that they do best because that is revolution scientifically that we want to bring in and, uh, and live. Absolutely. I, I can hear the passion and the enthusiasm behind it. And I, I love that. I, I love that you're excited about it. Um, and yeah, I think that you're right. Uh, it is expensive, uh, but it, it has to be. And having those partnerships with those commercial companies, uh, although it is still expensive, eventually uh, is going to help bring down the costs. Uh, sure, absolutely. By reusing the rockets, the sustainability, it will eventually. It's absolutely. Down the yeah. Let's let's see how all this plays out. Okay. It's not. It's not. Let's put all our money in this and forget about the rest. This is competition at its best. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
and let's see let's let's give it let's give it the chance that it deserves you know so so there's room to grow in that area even though the sls is up and running let's see what starship can do i want it to be successful absolutely well i agree with you there uh let's see i've got two other questions uh that i want to make sure we get asked uh that came from okay. the listeners uh one is Finding local water must be a high priority. Do you have an opinion regarding water recovery from mineral deposits like sulfates? And this is from Kevin. Yeah, I do. I think it's far easier to get it out of the ice. And as I mentioned on Mars, there's a huge North Polar cap that's been buried, uh, an ancient polar cap that we can get to. And it's right now sitting at mid latitudes. So uh, uh, one thing I did in 2015 is... Um, uh, we had a workshop. I helped organize a workshop uh, on bringing scientists and, and engineers uh, on the human spaceflight side together to pick a site on Mars to go to. Okay. And so that workshop was held at LPI. Fabulous workshop. And, and out of that, uh, the, the teams came in and were, were presenting why their site was the best one to be at. And indeed, we had like uh, uh, 50, 50 sites or so that we, uh, we talked about. And then what we did is we realized uh, we needed more information. So that enabled us to task the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to get data for each of these sites, additional data. Now, uh, the high-resolution imaging from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter it, you know, can't do the whole surface. It's only done four or five percent of the surface, and it's been orbiting Mars since 2006. Well, Mars is a big place, and it, you know, and if you want to get a meter resolution on the ground, it's going to take a long time. And so, this is why we did this workshop is to is to really figure out where these sites are. Now, NASA's approach to Mars is, of course, creating an exploration zone. Once we decide on that location, we'll go to that location. Uh, for for decades, you know, over and over and over again. It won't be like the Martian where we'll go to Aries 1, Aries 2, Aries 3, etc. Mm -hmm. It'll be, we'll have uh, the Mars Exploration Zone and, and it'll be a 200 kilometer uh, area. We'll land in one spot, we'll live in another spot, we'll do ISRU, but it'll be also scientifically rich. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that site has to be found uh, and that has to be determined. But we, we've got, you know, nearly 50 sites to consider right now. So the next workshop hopefully will be in another year or so when all that data is in. And then we can whittle it down to maybe the top 10. All right. And then study those in more detail. So we'll see how that evolves. Yeah. Well, speaking of sending humans to Mars and, and picking those locations, uh, I have another question from uh, David. The question is, should we just wait until NTP is developed before sending humans to Mars? Nah. <laughs> no. Nah. No. So um, Curiosity has uh, a dosimeter on it. And Curiosity, uh, you know, went all the way to Mars, landed, roved on Mars. Uh, we've analyzed that data. Uh, we know the, the environment is, is a tough environment. And indeed... Um, uh, uh, produces uh, risks. Uh, and in fact, uh, the analysis seems to indicate that instead of a 3% chance of cancer, you might get a 5% chance of cancer on a similar trajectory during a similar time for, for astronauts. So I can guarantee if I walked in the JSC in their, in their Monday morning briefing room where all the astronauts are there and I can say, uh, uh, you know, the, the risk for cancer on a route like this during this type of, uh, of solar conditions, it goes from three to 5%. How many want to go? Every hand in the room would still go up. I mean, you know, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is enormous medical advantages are, are, are being created. Uh, it, it, I would recommend that, that uh, your listeners read a book. It's called The Next 500 Years. It's by Chris Mason, and he talks about the evolution of medicine as it, rel as it relates to space medicine and all the techniques that, that are coming about that can be employed you know, for gene repair and, 
and, and uh, uh, gene expression and, and, and repair of the DNA and, and all the stuff that, that it, it are, are known hazards uh, for radiation in space. Fabulous book. It's absolutely fabulous book. All right. It's going on my, my to read list. Um, yeah, you should read it. I'm, I'm, I, Chris Mason was, was uh, uh, brought on by NASA to study the twins data. So the first couple, the first chapter or two of the book is all about the top things that were found in the twin study. And so that turns out to be uh, a fabulous uh, set of information that then is the springboard for the rest of the book. And uh, Chris does a fabulous job talking about uh, the, the investments that are being made and the advances that are being made and the humans that will go to Mars will be genetically engineered to be able to make the trip, live and work on that planetary surface for a couple year trip. And that's what we're moving towards. And we can do it. Read the book. All right. Well, I'll report back after. Uh, after yeah, I do so. Um, yeah, actually, you should have Chris Mason on. Okay. And have, him, have him talk about the book. Tell, to, uh, 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 if you want to, if you want, I've got his email. I'll give it to you. All right, there we go, Michael. I know you're listening, so we're, that's going to be on our our next to up list. list. Yeah, right. Um, well, I know we're coming up on time, and I, I wanted to make sure um, that I asked you. After 42 years uh, at NASA, now okay. you're retired, and you've got a few other uh, projects you're working on. What's next for you? Can you talk a little bit about uh, sure, sure. your other project? Uh, yeah, and I, are you going to write a book? Oh yeah, I, I actually be on my two yes, really. yes, I, I actually plan on writing a book about my NASA experience. Uh, I have um, quite a quite a bit of stuff to talk about, all the way from my experiences in the neutral buoyancy tank at Marshall Space Flight Center when I made a 150 dives to the missions I've been involved in. Um, uh, I've been involved in oh, probably more than two dozen missions from various aspects, from not only the instrument aspect as a as a uh, uh, instrument co-investigator, but as a deputy project scientist, and certainly as as a head of a, a planetary science uh, science division at headquarters, constructing and and creating a new strategic mission, selling it to uh, the administrator, selling it to NASA, uh, uh, getting it approved by. Uh, the president and uh, uh, OMB, the Office of Business and Management, or Management and Business, and then going to Congress and and presenting the advantages and and eventually getting the money for that. And that includes Percy, mm -hmm. that includes Clipper, uh, that includes Dart. You know, th those are the kind of things that I did uh, for 12 years as head of as head of uh, the Planetary Science Division. So um, uh, those were those are fabulous experiences that I, 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 I need to uh, indeed talk about in my memoirs. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't wait. I'm going to pre-order. Uh, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do a signed version if, if we can keep yeah, the range. I'll, I'll, I'll show up at the Mars Society and, 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 and if, 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 if uh, Nichelle Nichols can do it, I can do it for at least two hours. If the line goes out the door, that'll be great. I would love it. <laughs> there we go. Well, Michael and James, uh, I know, you, again, you're listening. We've got uh, somebody ready for Mars Society, or the Mars Society uh, convention. Uh, we're going gonna to have Jim come there. Well, Jim, I know we're, we're right at time. I just have to say a major thank you so much for, you. for coming on today's episode and, and sharing your experience and your knowledge um, this was a wonderful conversation. Again, so many other things I wanted to ask you, uh, after your 42 years of experience, I mean, just incredible what, what you've been able to do. I, I, I have seen it all. I have seen and experienced it all. <laughs> well, I can't wait to read about it in your book. Um, yeah, as soon as that that's out. I'm right. Gonna... And, and, and now I'm teaching space in the metaverse. So I've already developed a series of courses. You know, I have an avatar. I go in and, and we have three-dimensional models of, 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 of perseverance and ingenuity. You know, the students walk around. I can tell them, you know, what each of these things do, why they're doing it and coring rock and bringing the rock back and why that's so important uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, understanding potential uh, life on Mars. But certainly it's, uh, it's uh, evolution over time geologically and even atmospheric 
uh, uh, aspects that can be can be done. So uh, teaching in the metaverse has just really, uh, really been fantastic. So if you got an Oculus, uh, you know, uh, sign up, you, know, you sign up. Yeah. Walk into, walk into my classroom on one of these days and enjoy it. You're going to see an influx of uh, registrants now. After That'd the- be good. That'd be good. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you again so much. I really appreciate your time. Uh, A special thank you to Michael Stoltz, the James Burke, uh, our friends at Liftport. Thank you so much for all your help today. And thank you, listeners. Uh, You had excellent questions. Uh, This was an engaging conversation. So thank you for everybody's participation. Uh, Thank you, everybody. And as you always hear me say, the best is yet to come. Have a great day, everybody. Bye now.